And I'm thankful for you today. And, you know, I've, I've figured and I've found something out uh, for Mother's Day. It, it's kind of like this. Mother's Day, they get, they get great gifts. You know, you're trying to get something for your wife because your kids are too little to do it yet. And so you send them to get a massage or, you, you know, you're sending flowers. You're doing that kind of thing. And it's, honey, it's Mother's Day. You do whatever you want. But whenever Father's Day comes around, it's always kind of like, are you going to spend time with your children today? They don't even, they couldn't even pick you up out of lineup. You know, you need to spend time with those kids. So the deal gets turned around and uh, a lot of times in church uh, uh, the Mother's Day sermons are sweet and then the dad's sermons are really tough on Father's Day so I'm looking for something that men might like today in my preaching and when I think about stuff that guys would like uh, like to hear the story and like to hear some of the highlights from I can't help but think about King David whenever you look at David you look at one of the stories that men would love Jesse and I were going to the movies together, and we used to do movies like this. We'd go out on a date, we would eat, then we would go to a movie. And one week, Jesse would get to pick the movie, and then the next week, it was my turn. Thank God now, after 17 years of marriage, we've given up. We go have dinner together, and then we go our separate ways. We kiss each other, and we part for 90 minutes and go watch. I go watch what I want to watch. She goes and watches what she wants to watch. And I'll tell you, our marriage has gotten a whole lot better ever since then. <laughs> Thank God for that. I'll never have to watch a movie like The Notebook again as long as I live. Come on, men. You ought to say amen. You ought to give the Lord a hand clap right now. But if you were at the theater and there was a movie up about King David and about his life, I'm telling you, you ought to watch it and guys would love it. Because in that movie, you're going to see a man that comes out of obscurity and he rises to greatness. You're going to see a young man who goes from a shepherd to being a warrior. You'll see a guy who survives an assassination attempt multiple times. You'll see a guy who takes a bunch of misfits running for their life and turns them in to one of the strongest military forces in their known world in that time. You'll see a guy that goes from being simply a shepherd to being a guy who drives out the enemies of Israel and establishes a kingdom. You'll see treachery in his house. You'll see affairs. You'll see murder. You'll see things that, that, that are tough. It's everything that a guy would like to like. Uh, would, would like to see in a movie. And uh, I, I'm telling you, David is one of these guys that he's incredible. Of all the literature, inspired literature in the Bible, the most literature devoted to anyone, number one, is devoted to Jesus. But the second person that has the most literature devoted to him in the Bible is King David. If you have your Bible on you this morning, I want you to go ahead and open it up to the 23rd Psalm. Let's go to the 23rd Psalm. And I'll show you one of the greatest uh, songs and greatest pieces of poetry that was ever written, the 23rd Psalm. And it, it reads like this, if you have your Bible on you today. It says these words. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Somebody say amen there. And as you read through this psalm, man, you've heard it at funerals, you, you've heard it around the world, one of the most known pieces of scripture that's ever been penned. You can see different highlights of David's life. You can see different things that I like about David and things that I love about David and things that I identify with David in areas in. And if I were to be honest with you as a man, when I read the life of Jesus, I want to be more like Jesus. But sometimes it's hard for me to see myself in the life of Jesus. How many of y'all have ever felt that way when you read those scriptures? But when I read about David, I see somebody that it's more easy for me to identify with at times. Anybody else ever felt that way? Come on, how many of y'all want to be more like Jesus? I want to be more like Jesus. But often I see more of David in a lot of our lives. And here's one of the first things that I love about David. Here's some things I love about David and some things that we all see about David. The first thing that I love about David is that David was a worshiper. Everybody say worship. 
Come on, worship is something that can be hard for guys at times. And David is a warrior. David's a guy that leads a kingdom to its greatest heights. But David is also one of the greatest worshipers recorded in the Bible. Whenever David comes on the scene, David is living on the backside of the wilderness watching his father's sheep. And he's out there with a harp. And David, somewhere young in his life, he begins to love music. And he learns about the presence of God. And he begins to write psalms and songs to God. And he would sing them by himself to pass the time. And he becomes such a a wonderful worshiper. There was another king by the name of Saul who was David's predecessor. And Saul had a lot going on in his life. If you read down through Saul's life, the longer Saul remains in power, it seems like Saul's plagued with mental illness. And then the Bible says that an evil spirit would also come upon Saul. And Saul would be vexed with anxiety and, and almost uh, all sorts of paranoid behavior. And he would get so out of sorts, the people in his kingdom didn't know what to do for Saul. So what they would do is they went and they found young David a worshiper. And they brought David and they would have David play his instrument in the presence of Saul. And as David would begin to worship the Lord and pray, play that instrument, peace and anointing would flood the room and it would drive the evil spirit from Saul. Do you know why we worship together every Sunday morning? I believe whenever we come together as the church and we worship that the anointing of God is released in a corporate sense and demonic strategy and attack is driven out of your life. And I'm going to tell you this, men, if you'll begin to become a man of worship, in your house. Whenever you begin to lift up your voice to the Lord in the morning or you open up the Bible and you quote it with authority and you lift your hands to heaven, not because you feel emotional but because the Bible says men everywhere ought to lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. I believe that there's an anointing released in your house that can drive depression from your children and addiction from your seed. Come on, somebody give God a hand clap. It can bring freedom into your house. Man, David had that kind of thing. He's the the warrior king of worship. David loved worship so much. Uh, David had a heart to build God a temple. Before he ever built God a temple, he brought the Ark of the Covenant back into the middle of Jerusalem. And he set up a 24-hour worship service where people would come and fall down and worship before the Ark without a veil between them and us. Man, I, I want to be a person of worship. You know, worship really was something that impressed me whenever I came and got born again, got my life right with Christ. I was raised in a, in a Christian environment, but the church that I was raised in, great people, loved the Bible, loved Jesus, believed the gospel. But my church, let me see if any of your churches were like this. In my church, the women sing whenever the song service would go. But the men never would sing, wouldn't worship. They never did anything. We stand there very stoic with our hands crossed. Anybody raised in a church like mine coming up? And uh, every now and then it was kind of that kind of environment. And every now and then somebody would sneak into our church service and they'd lift a hand and we'd be like, look at that crazy from the Pentecostal church. Got in our our church this morning, you know. It's kind of the way we felt about it. And uh, what happened is my brother started going to a church like this. And he would would invite me to come. I was this real messed up kid, and I would never show up, never show up, never show up. And then finally one day I went to church with him, and uh, I'm sitting there in church. I think it was, it might have been a Father's Day. I think it was a Father's Day. And and, and I went to to church uh, because it was a family day, and I came in about 5 that morning, got cleaned up, went to church, and the worship started. And when the worship started, there was an old man in the back somewhere. And all of a sudden, this old man comes walking down the aisle. And I'm sitting there, and I'm watching. And he walks all the way up to the front. He's an older black gentleman. And the music starts. And when the music starts, this guy starts worshiping. He lifts his hands up. And then the music's going. He starts dancing. He's taking it forward. And then he'd go forward as far as he could. And then he'd back it up a little bit, you know. (laughs) He'd back it up for a while. And then he'd take it forward, worshiping the Lord. And then he'd back it up. And I'm watching this. He's up front. And I thought, man, there's no way in the world that I would ever be able to get up there and do something like that with all these people around me. And it kind of impressed upon me at that time that this this guy had something with the Lord that I didn't even know was possible. And his worship, it impacted my life. God used it as a reminder to remind me that this guy had something that, that I didn't have. 
Come on, I'm going to tell you, church, that your worship has the ability not just to move heaven and not just to move you, but your worship has the ability to move somebody else. Somebody around you, a son, a daughter, a grandchild, a family member, a co-worker, whenever they see you worshiping the Lord. It can leave an impact. That guy was like 100 years old. You know, Jesse and I, we, I, I got saved later. Jesse and I got married. We went and got educated. And after I got out of college, I was preaching around in the area. And I preached at another church down there in Madisonville, Kentucky. And they started the music at that church. And guess what? A little old man came out of the back, came to the front, began to take it forward and back it up. And I got to tell him, he's like 120 then, about what his worship did in my life. Come on, let's give God a hand clap for the people that have impacted our life with their worship. Amen? I love David because he was a worshiper. One of the second things I'm, I'm intrigued about David is because he became a man of great wealth and influence. And you know, David was a long shot to become that kind of God. If you look at David's family, he was from Bethlehem, and he was one of the younger brothers, and he was really not esteemed by his family. Prophet comes to prophesy out of Jesse's family, which was David's father, that there's a king in your household. And Jesse discounts David so much, he doesn't even bring him to the party the day the prophet shows up to prophesy the next king in. The prophet looks at all of his boys and says, the next king isn't here. Then he turns around and he asks Jesse, he says, are, are all your sons here? And listen, in that day, you didn't lie to the prophet. You didn't keep the prophet waiting. Now, if you disagree with me today, you'll go home and everything will be all right. In the Old Testament, you disagree with the prophet. She bears eat you and, and the ground opens up and there's trouble. And, and so Jesse says, well, all my sons, they're, they're not here. Well, one of them's out tending the sheep and they bring him. But before that, David didn't have a chance. The way the culture of the ancient Near East worked is the way you got ahead is you had to be the firstborn son. How many of y'all have ever heard of a double portion? You've heard that language? Here's the way it worked in the culture of the ancient Near East. If you were the firstborn son, you got two parts of the inheritance, and every other son only got one part. It's a patriarchal society. And then the eldest son would be in charge of everybody else. I love that God flips it. He takes somebody that's not supposed to make it. He turns the thing upside down, and he makes them climb to the top. And those who were supposed to be on the top end up serving the younger. The elder serves the younger in this story in the kingdom of God. As Americans, I think we love long shot stories because it doesn't matter what culture you come from in the world or what's your background or what's your genetic pedigree. I'm telling you, all of us ended up in America because somewhere across the pond, our family was failing. We weren't making it. Life wasn't what it should be. And we all got up, loaded up, and came to America. And God used a bunch of derelicts from another country to build the greatest nation on the earth. Your pedigree might not be perfect, but God can lift you up just like he did. King David. Come on, let's give God a hand clap like we believe it this morning. Do you think God can raise you up? Do you think God can raise your children up? Amen? Listen, David becomes the wealthiest man in his kingdom whenever he becomes a, a, a warrior and a leader. As a matter of fact, when it became time for him to give the plans to, of the temple to Solomon, David comes and in one offering, he gives over a billion dollars to the work of God. Gave a billion dollars to the church on one Sunday. I believe that God wants to call some of you to do that next Sunday in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen to that. Another thing that I love about David and I, I see about David and I respect this in David is that David was a man of war. Everybody say a warrior. I respect men and women of war. I respect the people in the room that have served in the armed forces, that you went to make sure our nation is free. How, how many of y'all think we ought to give all them a hand clap that have served us and put themselves in harm's way? Respect you and we honor you. David was the kind of guy that never ran from a fight. You see it coming up as a kid. You, you see these things in the 23rd Psalm. He says this. He says, he says that God prepares a table for me. He doesn't just say that God prepares a table for him. It says this, that the Lord prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. It's one thing to have a table prepared for you. It's a whole other thing to have a table prepared for you in the presence of your enemies. That statement comes out of the culture of war of the ancient Near East. 
Whenever two parties would draw up for war, if you go to Israel and the ground around Israel, it's very hilly, a lot of it. And one, one army would come and they would draw up on one hill. And they would set up camp there. Another army would come and they would draw up on another hill. And they would, they would stare each other down, sometimes for several days. They would yell at each other. They would moon each other. They would incite the war. They did all of that kind of stuff. And then the night before, one of them would decide that we're going to go out and we're going to spill blood in that valley tomorrow. They would throw the biggest party you could imagine. And they would, they would have food. They would have song. They would drink. And, and the, the king that was there, they would bring a table from one of the local cities. And they would bring the table and they would set the table in front of the king that night. And they would get as wild and loud as they could. See, the Lord prepares a table. David had seen it. He knew it. That even in the midst of the battle, that God would have a preparation and prepare a table for him in the presence of his enemies. You know what one of the biggest things you can do to confuse your enemy? If you're in the midst of a war and you're having one of the toughest times ever, you ought to bring out a table and prepare a party and never look afraid, never look scared, but you have the biggest time you could have. You laugh louder in the middle of the war. You praise a little bit louder in the middle of adversity. You get just a little bit more fervent in prayer and don't ever look like you're backing up and it'll scare the you-know-what out of your enemy if you'll be, if you'll be confident in the midst of battle. See, David was a warrior. He went out as a young man. He killed the lion. He killed the bear. As a matter of fact, he, he took the head of Goliath. That's what ascended, made him ascend to the seat to becoming a king in the future. It was all surrounded around war. And a lot of people might look at David as he goes out to Goliath and he looks like uh, someone who is an underdog. But if David was not anything when he's fighting Goliath, uh, uh, the common person looks at it and sees him as an underdog. But I'm telling you, David had every advantage whenever he fights Goliath. A lot of people don't know it. They don't see it. That's the way the devil wants to keep it. When there's a giant out screaming at you, all you can see is the giant. But here's some things a lot of us never think about. So there were three different types of warriors in the ancient Near East. One was infantry. Everybody say infantry. Man, they were designed for hand-to-hand, toe-to-toe combat. We're going to stand face to face. We're going to trade licks. We're going to fight with a sword. We're going to see who's the strongest right here. So one were, was infantry. The second was archers and slingers. You might call them artillery. David was a guy that used a sling. As a matter of fact, he would stand. He would practice with it all the time as a kid. When we talk about a sling, we're not talking about a child slingshot. We're talking about a big rope sling. Now, I've watched them use them around Israel before. They're selling them, but there's some kids around that can really hit something with one. And they say if you get a guy that really knows how to use a sling, really knows how to throw one, it can be deadly from 200 yards. They say that it has the same velocity and knockdown power. If it's got the right kind of stone in it, it can have the same knockdown power that a 45 pistol has. Now we're talking about a weapon, aren't we? We're not talking about a kid's toy. So Goliath comes out nine feet tall. As a massive target. And David comes out with a 45 pistol in his hand. I'll take a 45 over a big man any day of the week. Somebody say amen to that. Everybody's looking at David like he doesn't stand a chance. But the God of all heaven, what he does for the people who were fighting his armies is he stacks the deck in our favor. You can go out in a battle and you can think you're beat before you get there, but I'm going to tell you that the Lord of hosts is looking to give his sons and daughters an advantage. And if we'll just take the advantage that he'll give us, we will win in life and take the head of our enemies. You can win in any war. You have a supernatural advantage. I'm telling you, we already have an advantage in the name of Jesus. We already have an advantage in his blood. We already have an advantage in the Word of God. Come on, somebody. We already have an advantage in the Holy Spirit. We already have an advantage in the gifts. We already have an advantage in the still, small voice. No Goliath is going to get the best of us. See, I I love David also because David was a man of weakness. I identify with his weaknesses. David said this. He said these words. He said that God would restore his soul. In the 23rd Psalm. Have you ever had a point in life where you needed your soul restored? Come on, somebody. I mean, it's just like the inside of me. I need a healing on the inside. David had been there. Why? Because he was a man of weakness. And all of us have some sort of weakness. We have some sort of bend. And you, you, ought, to, 
you, you do well and I do well to not judge other people based on their weaknesses. How many know there's a difference between someone who's wicked and someone who has a weakness? Now, I don't want to be hard on people that have a weakness. I don't, I don't, have, a, I don't have a problem being hard on someone that's wicked. I, I'll be hard on someone that's wicked all day long. So there's really three types of people. There's the redeemed. There's the non-redeemed who are non-Christians. But uh, I've met some non-Christians that are pretty decent people. They're good people. They'll be good in a business deal. They'll be nice to you. They're likable. They're, they're, they're good people. They're just not right with Christ. They're not saved, but they're good. There's a third type of person that's just wicked. The Bible talks about them. And their, their intent is ill and they're evil. And, and there's a way you deal with a wicked person that's different than you deal with the rest of the people on earth. See, that, that, that there's a difference in, in those things. Now, David wasn't a wicked man, but he was a man who had weaknesses. One of his weaknesses was that he didn't know how to deal with his family at all. David's father hadn't dealt with him appropriately. Because of that, David didn't know how to deal with his children appropriately. And he, he would just avoid issues. Issues would come up and David wouldn't even talk about them. How many of y'all have recognized if you don't talk about it, it doesn't go away? Come on. Let's say this out loud. Say this out loud. Say, if I don't talk about it, it'll still be there. Let's say it again. If I don't talk about it, it'll still be there. You know, I was raised in a house where my father really didn't talk about anything like that unless he was very, very angry and, uh, you know, he had a lot to say about it. And he would talk about it very briefly and very harshly, and then it would be over. And I, I had a great dad. It was just, it was one of his weaknesses. And the way it worked in my house is dad would tell mom. So dad was kind of like the father in the Trinity. He would be in the Holy of Holies in his bedroom. He would tell mom the Holy Spirit, and then mom the Holy Spirit would come and bring you the message of what was bothering my father. And a lot of you dads are like that out there. You ought to go ahead and learn to talk about it. Come on, somebody say learn to talk about it. Yeah, see, David had things like this go on in his house. His, uh, his son got infatuated with his half-sister. And his son raped his daughter. David did nothing. Nothing. That's something you got to talk about, isn't it? Man, and then another son of David's got angry at the, the son that raped the half-sister. And so he called all the other sons out to a party and assassinated the son that raped the brother. And you know what David did about it? Nothing. Because David wouldn't step in. There's a time. Do you know why you're a man, man? You're, you're a man because you're the guy that steps in, looks at what it was. You take the punches. You take the hits. If somebody's got to get hit, it's going to be you. That's what men do. Come on. Somebody say amen to that. And so you got to step into the situation. There's a time when the stuff hits the fan, you're in the room. And it's not my wife's job to get in the situation. It's not my children's job to get in the situation. It is my job to get in the situation. That's why we are called men. That's why we're husbands. That's why we're here. We protect and love and care for. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap. I'm getting too intense. I'm smiling now. I'm preaching to men for a minute, all right? 